Hello and welcome back to Write America. This literary series was dreamed up by author and friend Roger Rosenblatt in an effort to bridge this great divide in our country through readings and conversations from award-winning, nationally renowned authors and new and emerging writers. My name is Lauren and I will be uh, your host for the evening. I am the event coordinator over at Book Review. If you are not familiar with our store, Book Review is Long Island's largest independent bookstore located in Huntington Village. Uh, we have a fantastic episode in store for you tonight featuring um, readings from uh, Ishmael Reed and Jean Hanf Korolitz. Uh, Susan Isaacs had a little bit of a tech issue, so she is actually unable to make it here tonight. Uh, we're going to reschedule her for later in the series so that you'll still get to hear uh, readings from her. Uh, if you happen to miss last week's episode with Amy Cachola, Cornelia Channing, and Suchita Nayar, you can, or any of the previous episodes for that matter, you can visit our Crowdcast channel at any time. Uh, and watch the recordings there. Uh, tonight's episode is also going to be recorded, so if you miss something or you know someone uh, who couldn't be here live tonight, you can send the link uh, that got you here to them so that they can watch the replay. Uh, now, before we get started with the readings, there are just a couple of things that you will all need to know about Crowdcast tonight. Um, first off, there is a button right down here below the screen um, where you can purchase, if you click that button, it'll bring you to bookreview.com where you can purchase signed copies um, of the author's books. There is also a button down here that says, ask a question. If a question pops into your mind during the readings or the conversation, just click it down below so that um, we'll get to your question at the end for the audience Q&A. And I see that some of you have found the chat, so please feel free to talk amongst yourselves, chat about the readings, uh, add to the conversation, and of course, drop your emoji applause so that we know that you like what you're hearing. Um, now, before we get started with the readings, we have a special guest here to say a few words to mark the halfway point of the Write America series. So please welcome to the screen our friend Roger Rosenblatt. Hi, Lauren. Hi, Roger. I, I, will, I will not take more than a minute or so, but I did want to also mark the idea that we are at the exact halfway point of this season. And it's nice to say this season because now we know we are going to go into 2022 in this perfect partnership with Book Review and with you, Lawrence. So there's something very good about that, something to be quite happy about. In the 2022 season, we're going to do a little something different. Uh, Alice McDermott came up with this terrific idea that we would organize book clubs around the country and libraries around the country to have meetings after each of our Monday meetings so that it was to continue to you know, keep the reverberations going and spread the word. I'm going to mark this little occasion just with thanks. Thanks first to you, Lauren. Uh, nobody has uh, done this and you created a, a, a whole world. Nobody could have done it more graciously and more efficiently. Uh, it's astonishing how unflappable you are. I was so glad a few weeks ago you made a mistake. I will uh, hold on to that forever and see if I can possibly get the most out of it. Uh, the writers, I want to thank the writers who would not, they, what, a, what a remarkable, remarkable uh, group of talented and diverse, diverse writers that were known for their work. And in this context of Write America, a display of spirit, a spirit which I've never seen before and which is such a pleasure, a spirit of camaraderie for one another. You will see in the chats, you'll see it tonight and you saw it every night that we've done it. And we, I don't know how there have been 21, 22 uh, episodes so far. People chiming in, cheering on their colleagues, asking interesting questions, making a community of a group that doesn't necessarily, that hardly ever really gets together. And uh, the incomparable Rita Dove uh, comes in so often, Paul Harding, Jill McCorkle comes in all the time, uh, Amy Hempel, Lloyd Schwartz, Molly Gaudry, Major Jackson uh, comes in from all over, wherever wherever he is, Joyce Maynard, the wonderful fiction writer, Hilma Willitzer hardly misses uh, performance. And Fadiman and George Colt said this is their date night, that um, the uh, Monday night is their date night. So we're sustaining marriages as we go along. The We thank the writers uh, uh, for everything. And principally, we thank you, the audience, to this surprising event. This whole deal is a gamble, uh, a gamble on all our parts. We go through an act of discovery with Write America, much as we do in our own writing, seeing what we come up with. But one thing was for sure, at the beginning of all this, we saw and continue to see a riven country, a riven country, politically, racially. Uh, 
So you ask, what could writers do? What could writers possibly do? And writers are not naturally uh, a group of anything. We are loners, antisocial, uh, misfits generally. The idea of our being able to come up with anything that we did that would be useful seemed to stretch. And yet, and yet we discovered that we could do something by simply doing our stuff, doing the things we do ordinarily. As writing depends, as writing depends on the connections among people, people depend on writing to find the connections among themselves. It, we are one community, one community, uh, the same. So we saw, and we suffer the same uh, shames and griefs and fears and share the same laughter. We are one, one animal, one person. Um, writing makes justice desirable, evil intelligible, grief endurable, and love possible. And so we write, and we write for the very people, for you, this audience, who give us back more than we could ever know. We are in this all as one. Um, and how do we do it? Not with bullhorns and not with pulpits. We do it simply with the power of art, the quiet power of art, the quiet power of art. So to our audience, thank you for being with us in this. We are always with you. Now let me give it back to Lauren and these two wonderful writers before us. Thank you, Roger. It was so nice to see your face this evening. Um, I, we'll see you later in September. <laughs> <laughs> for your reading. All right. So up first, um, oh, Mindy or like Roger Rosenblatt. That was uh, who that was, um, our fearless leader. Um, so first we have a reading from Ishmael Reed. Ishmael is the author of over 25 books, including Mumbo Jumbo, Yellow Back Radio Broke Down, Conjugating Hindi, why No Confederate Statues in Mexico, and most recently, Why the Black Hole Sings the Blues, and The Haunting of Lin-Manuel Miranda. He is also a publisher, television producer, songwriter, radio and television commentator, and has long been devoted to exploring an alternative Black aesthetic, the trickster tradition, or neo-hoodooism. A regular contributor to Counterpunch and founder of the Before Columbus Foundation, he taught at the University of California, uh, Berkeley, for over 30 years. Ishmael is the only person to be nominated for the National Book Award in two categories in the same year. So please welcome to the screen, Ishmael Reed. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I would like to start off by reading a poem that was published in the latest issue of the North American Review, which is the oldest literary magazine in the United States. As a matter of fact, uh, Thomas Jefferson was a subscriber. And the name of the poem is Your January 6th Ain't Got Nothing to Do with 1776. January Sixers, whose idea was it to apply nouns like supremacy or supremacists to bums like you? The only thing that could lure you from pizza, beer, and football was the lies of the super spreader in chief. So there you were, hitting Capitol Police with baseball bats and bear spray, scaffolding material, asking for the speaker's head, and stealing her laptop, putting your feet on the speaker's desk, a 950,000 volt stud gun sticking out of your pocket, threatening to hang the vice president because he followed the law, even had a scaffolding noose on hand, displaying an enemy's flag, tossing papers, playing with the lectern, defacing the taxpayers' sculptures, gassing and chemical spraying their paintings while running like blind ostriches, all the while yelling 1776. Your January 6th ain't got nothing to do with our 1776. 
you weren't just rural left behinds posing for Grant Wood or times outback blonde standing next to a horse, but policemen, CEOs, soldiers, and firemen to join your mob posing at a militia as a militia. One of you arrived on a private jet. Another one owns a winery. The whole calamity was financed by a food market heiress. Tax breaks were not enough for this glutton. 1776. Now suppose the British were chasing your behind like they did Paul Revere and William Dawes who didn't have no fancy armor they bought at a sports goods store. Didn't have smartphones so, to, so they could coordinate their movements. Couldn't send text messages. How dare you tweet 1776? Your January 6th ain't got nothing to do with our 1776. You call yourself Minutemen with your Winnebago's at home in Queens or the suburbs of DC or condos in Pasadena or Orlando. Unlike your Michigan Minute Man interviewed from his vacation home, Peter Salem, a black man, was a real Minute Man. When British Major John Pickering ordered the Patriots to retreat from Bunker Hill, Salem refused and took down the major. A real patriot, he died in the poorhouse. Unlike your January Sixers, he didn't have no overtime pay, vacation time, no pension, sick leave, no long-term care, no union to, to have his back when he killed an unarmed person. The black soldiers, who under the command of Colonel John Glover provided George Washington with cover when he retreated from New York. They were real patriots. Otherwise, he would have been captured and executed by the British. After being driven out of New York by the Howe brothers, we crossed the Delaware and up to our next winter. That's Peter or Prince Whipple, a black man in the painting by Emmanuel Lutz. Was no airline attendant serving us top shelf wine, Amtrak offering us free Wi-Fi, no buffet breakfast at a four star restaurant and waitress is asking us if we wanted more coffee. General James Grant was right when General Hall asked for reinforcements as we were overcoming the enemy in Trenton. He said, what you worried about a bunch of farmers? Quote, they neither have shoes nor stockings, are in fact almost naked, starving for coal without blankets. While embarrassing your children with a wild rampage, you return to your comfortable hotel and enjoy the chocolate vents that the maid left underneath your hotel pillow or you join your fellow vandals in the hotel bar where you celebrated your victory. You made it back in time for happy hour. You guys are Fox News patriots, sunshine patriots. You share your manhood by refusing to wear a mask. Our targets were British, your targets or two unarmed Congresswomen, Nancy Pelosi and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. You say you want to take back your country. If it wasn't for the Continental Army, you would have no country. The Continental Army were a bunch of immigrants whom you hate, free blacks, children, and slaves. You don't like Jews? Colonel Mordecai Sheftal and Hyman Solomon. Quote, the prime financier of the Revolutionary War. Our revolutionary heroes who made it possible for your dumbasses to mock Auschwitz. You think it's funny 
to give ball teams Indian names. Quote, the Oneida Warriors ambushed some of the British soldiers and provided some delayed action as the army started retreating back to Valley Forge. They were the last to cross the Scully Hill River in the army. It is thought that six Oneidas were killed during this engagement and they are buried at St. Peter's Church Cemetery in Barrett Hill, end of quote. You despise blacks and retweet jokes about them on your social media. The same old joke. Blacks left their bloody footprints at Valley Forge so that you can place nooses in their workplaces or call the former president a pimp and his wife a whore. After you trash the Capitol, you return home on Greyhound, Southwest, Hertz, or in the latest $50,000 cars. After that, he fought in the Continental Army, slaves were returned to slavery. Blacks, Jews, Indians fought under George Washington while your legacy is that you trashed the Capitol, didn't clean up after yourselves, lent it to workers whom you call niggers for desecrating and defecating in the people's temple. May your names forever stain on a wall of shame and the legion of dead heroes look upon you with disdain. Your January 6th ain't got nothing to do with our 1776. Thank you. All right, thank you so much for that extremely passionate reading. Um, we will see you um, right at the end for the conversation, hang tight. Okay, up next, we have a reading from uh, Jean Hanf Korlitz. Jean is the author of the novels You Should Have Known, which aired on HBO in October 2020 as The Undoing, starring Nicole Kidman, Hugh Grant, and Donald Sutherland. <clears throat> Admission, which was adapted as a film in 2013, starring Tina Fey, The Devil and Webster, The White Rose, the Sabbath Day River and a Jury of Her Peers, as well as in Interference Powder, a novel for children. Her company, Book the Writer, hosts pop-up book groups in which small groups of readers discuss new books with their authors. A new novel, The Late Comer, will be published in April 2022. So please welcome to the screen, Jean Hanf Korlitz. <laughs> Hi, Jean. <laughs> hey, Lauren, thank you so much. And Ishmael, that was just, Brilliant. Uh, I, I love that. I, I kept thinking of that, the, the phrase from that, that Jack Nicholson movie, you can't handle the truth. Um, in my fantasy, I was Jack Nicholson in that scenario. But anyway, um, so I'm thrilled to be here. And I've been uh, watching this wonderful series develop since, uh, since its inception. My husband, uh, who's a poet, took took part very early on and I've been waiting for my turn since then. Um, I wanna say a little bit about the plot, um, which is this book, which I'm gonna be reading from, uh, just so that the excerpt that I'm gonna read makes a little bit of sense. Um, it's, it's, it's so appropriate that this is really by writers for writers because this book is very much for writers. I've, you know, I've always uh, devoured books about writers, um, e even as I, uh, understood that we're not supposed to write about ourselves. Um, the conventional wisdom is that people don't like to read books about writers. I, I think I can, I, I think I can say that that's has not proved to be the case, at least with, with, uh, with regard to this book. So, um, this is a novel about a writer who I think we can probably call a failed writer. Um, he is, his name is Jake. He uh, had a, a teeny tiny bit of success with his first novel uh, and really has been pretty much tapped out since then. And uh, as the years go by, he's sort of getting farther and farther from his dream of being a successful writer. And he has taken a teaching job in uh, really a pretty awful um, 
uh, creative writing program, a low residency creative writing program in Vermont. And into his class walks the worst of all possible students, real arrogant jerk who, uh, you know, has a huge ego and, and great claims for his unwritten novel. Um, and he doesn't want to share the magnificent plot of his novel, but finally he does in a private conference. And Jake, to his great uh, dismay, <laughs> realizes that everything that this guy uh, is saying about all the wonderful things that are going to happen when he writes his novel uh, are absolutely true. This is a brilliant, brilliant story. It is unkillable. Um, all of the wonderful things that this guy thinks uh, are going to happen to him probably are going to happen to him. And there's absolutely nothing to be done about that. You know, there are rules about that. And so he, um, you know, with great dismay, he he watches this student walk out of his classroom knowing that he himself will not be successful, but this guy, this guy will. A few years later, he realizes that he's never heard about this novel and, and he would have, it, it is really that kind of a plot. And so he goes searching for, his former student and what he discovers is that his student is dead and not not recently either. His student has been dead pretty much since their encounter, which of course has implications for this marvelous story. And um, the excerpt that I'm about to read really takes place um, as Jake grapples with that uh, new reality, sort of the turning point, what he decides to do about that. So. Here we go. Later, of course, Jake would go back to this moment. Later, he would recognize it for the crossroads it was, but already he was wrapping this stark years after the fact set of circumstances in the first of what would be many layers of rationalization. Those layers had not much at all to do with the fact that Jake was a moral human being with presumably a code of ethical conduct. Mainly, they had to do with the fact that he was a writer. And being a writer meant another allegiance to something of even higher value, which was the story itself. Jake didn't believe in much. He didn't believe that any God had made the universe, let alone that said God was still watching the goings on and keeping track of every human act, all for the purpose of assigning a few millennia of homo sapiens to a pleasant or an unpleasant afterlife. He didn't believe in an afterlife. He didn't believe in destiny, fate, luck, or the power of positive thinking. He didn't believe that we get what we deserve or that everything happens for a reason. What reason would that be? Or that supernatural forces impacted anything in a human life. What was left after all of that nonsense? The sheer randomness of the circumstances we are born into, the genes we've been dealt, our varying degrees of willingness to work our asses off, and the wit we may or may not possess to recognize an opportunity should it arise. But there was one thing he actually did believe in that bordered on the magical, or at least the beyond pedestrian, and that was the duty a writer owed to a story. Stories, of course, are common as dirt. Everyone has one, if not an infinity of them, and they surround us at all times, whether we acknowledge them or not. Stories are the wells we dip into to be reminded of who we are and the ways we reassure ourselves that however obscure we may appear to others, we are actually important, even crucial, to the ongoing drama of survival, personal, societal, even as a species. But stories, despite all that, are also maddeningly elusive. There is no deep mine of them to blast around in or a big box store with wide aisles of unused, undreamed of, and thrillingly new narratives for the writer to push a big empty shopping cart through, waiting for something to catch their eye. And every now and then, some magical little spark flew up out of nowhere and landed in the consciousness of a person capable of bringing it to life. This was occasionally called inspiration, though inspiration was not a word writers themselves often used. Those magical little sparks tended not to waste time in declaring themselves. They woke you up in the mornings with an annoying tap tap and a sense of unfolding urgency and they hounded you through the days that followed. The idea, the characters, the problem, the setting, lines of dialogue, descriptive phrases, and opening sentence. To Jake, the word that comprised the relationship between a writer and their spark was responsibility. 
Once you were in possession of an actual idea, you owed it a debt for having chosen you and not some other writer. And you paid that debt by getting down to work not just as a journeyman fabricator of sentences, but as an unshrinking artist, ready to make painful, time-consuming, even self-flagellating mistakes. Rising to this responsibility was a matter of facing your blank page or screen and muzzling the critics inside your head at least long enough for you to get some work done, all of which was profoundly difficult and none of which was optional. What's more, you stepped away from it at your peril, because if you failed in this grave responsibility, you might well find after some period of distraction or even less than fully committed work that your precious spark had left you. Gone, in other words, as suddenly and unexpectedly as it had appeared and your novel along with it. Though you might spin your wheels for a few months or a few years or the rest of your life, hopelessly throwing words onto the page or screen in a stubborn refusal to face what had happened. And there was something else, an extra dark superstition for any writer hubristic enough to ignore the spark of a great idea, even if that writer was not of a religious bent, even if he did not believe that everything happens for a reason, even if indeed he resisted magical thinking of every other conceivable kind. The superstition that held, held that if you did not do right by the magnificent idea that had chosen you among all possible writers to bring it to life, that great idea didn't just leave you to spin your stupid and ineffectual wheels. It actually went to somebody else. A great story, in other words, wanted to be told. And if you weren't going to tell it, it was out of here. It was going to find another writer who would. And you would be reduced to watching somebody else write and publish your book. Intolerable. Once long ago, Jake had done his best to honor what he'd been given. He had recognized his spark and done right by it, never shirking the hard thinking and the careful writing, pushing himself to do well and then to do better. He had pursued no shortcuts and evaded no effort. He had taken his chance against the world, submitting himself to the opinions of publishers, reviewers, and ordinary readers. But favor had passed over him and moved on to others. What was he to do? Who was he to be if no other spark ever came to him again. It was unbearable to contemplate. Good writers borrow, great writers steal, Jake was thinking. That ubiquitous phrase was attributed to T.S. Eliot, which didn't mean Eliot hadn't himself stolen it. But Eliot had been talking perhaps less than seriously about the theft of actual language. Phrases and sentences and paragraphs, not of a story itself, besides, Jake knew, as Eliot had known, as all artists ought to know, that every story, like every single work of art, from the cave paintings to whatever was playing at the Park Theater in Cobleskill, a few miles down the road from where I am now, to his own puny books, was in conversation with every other work of art, bouncing against its predecessors, drawing from its contemporaries, harmonizing with the patterns, all of it paintings and choreography and poetry and photography and performance art and the ever fluctuating novel was whirling away in an unstoppable spin art machine of its own. And that was a beautiful, thrilling thing. He would hardly be the first to take some tale from a play or a book, in this case, a book that had never been written and create something entirely new from it. Miss Saigon from Madam Butterfly, The Hours from Mrs. Dalloway, the Lion King from Hamlet, for goodness sake. It wasn't even taboo, and obviously it wasn't theft. Even if Parker's manuscript actually existed at the time of his death, Jake had never seen more than a couple of pages of the thing, and he remembered little of what he had seen. Surely what he himself might make from so little would belong to him and only to him. These then, were the circumstances in which Jake found himself that January evening at his computer in his cruddy Cobleskill apartment in the leather stocking region of upstate New York, out of pride, hope, time, and he could finally admit ideas of his own. He hadn't gone looking for this. He had upheld the honor of writers who listened to the ideas of other writers and then turned responsibly back to their own. He had absolutely not invited the brilliant spark his student had abandoned, 
okay, and voluntarily abandoned to come to him, but come it had. And here it was, this urgent shimmering thing, already tap tapping in his head, already hounded him, the idea, the characters, the problem. So what was Jake going to do about that? A rhetorical question, obviously. He knew exactly what he was going to do about that. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> that was great. Oh, thank that was you. Wonderful. Thanks a lot. Well, the, the, ep the episodes of poetry in this uh, piece. In, in this like piece? Yeah, it's like prose poetry. Oh, thank section. you very much. Very well, beautiful. it's it's a deep, dark secret, but I started as a poet. Um, I see. The early years yeah, of shows. my writing life <laughs> were poets. Yeah, it shows. But um, actually, I, I ha there was something happened that made me stop writing poetry, and it's something mm -hmm. that you actually might remember. It took place in 1983. It had to do with a, an essay written by Donald Hall uh, mm -hmm. in, uh, I believe, in the Kenyon Review. I was studying mm -hmm. in England at the time, and I kept hearing about this essay, this Donald Hall essay that people were very upset about. And of course, this was pre-internet, so you heard it in letters. People would write you letters, oh, everybody's upset about this this uh, Donald Hall essay. And I, I went down to the library and I I read the essay. And it, it basically, he was, he was writing about the new MFA programs and how they were great at producing pretty good poets. Um, I think he called it the Mick Poem. He, these programs were producing the Mick poem, and uh, and that made it difficult for the one or two poets in every generation who were Keats to kind of be heard. And, and most people read that essay and they thought, "But I'm Keats." And I read that essay and I thought, "You know what? I'm not Keats." <laughs> <laughs> and I think you know I didn't stop uh, writing poetry right away. I, I I hung on long enough to to actually publish a book of poems. But I think I, it was one of the things that made me think, I think it's, you know, it's time to really admit that fiction is what I, is the dream. Mm -hmm. And the, you know, you have a lot of fear about writing, you know, as I'm sure you know, a novel. Whereas if you spend a day or a week or a month on a poem and it doesn't work, it's not like a novel where it's just years of your life. So, um, so that was all part of my, my turning away from poetry. And then, you know, I met, this guy, this who I'm married to now, and he kind of mm -hmm. was Keats in mm -hmm. my view. So, it, you know, the difference between what he was doing and what I was doing with poetry was pretty stark. So, um, so that was that was the big <laughs> that was the turning away of poetry. But but you're right, you don't get rid of it. It stays the rhythms and the sounds of language. Mm -hmm. They stick with you. So, one more thing. One more thing. Yeah. A critic couldn't have written that. A critic could not have written what you wrote. Oh, okay. It's like it could have, I mean, what you said probably applies to musicians and other dancers and other artists mm -hmm. who always feel they're being besieged. Yeah. You mentioned the middle persons, the reviewers, the critics, the publishers and all that. Quite an accomplishment. Yeah. Well, are you, is that something that you share, this idea that all, everything is in, in conversation with everything else? I, I don't know what you mean. That, you know, when you write a novel, you are, whether you've read every novel that's ever been written or not, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you are participating in a river that contains everything that everybody's ever done. So you are somehow swimming around in, the accomplishments of, you know, the 18th century, the 19th century, well, and last I think, week. I think that Elliot, you mentioned Elliot as uh, is a good example because he was a paste and scissors man. I mean, like his poem, his uh, poem, The Wasteland, grabs from different sources. Sure. Matter of fact, Robert Robert Frost said he's waiting for Elliot to write an original poem. <laughs> you know, there's so such a collage. So I think that's a good example of some yeah, and, and it's a good example. Grab things yeah. like a vacuum cleaner. They would absorb stuff from all all kinds of different places. That's right. That's right. And of course, you know, we're all readers, so mm -hmm. you don't just become a writer without having first fallen in love with literature, other people's work. So um, 
you know, one of the reasons I think I'm so interested in plagiarism is that I, I feel like deep down, uh, most of us are afraid that we're doing it without being aware of it. You know, when, when you, when you. That's considered avant-garde. That's considered avant-garde. Is that considered avant-garde? Really well, then I've ne nobody's ever told me I was avant-garde, no, so that's great. No, I'm, doing a I'm doing a play now that's opening in New York in December called The Slave Who Loved Caviar. Uh-huh. About, about the relationship between Basquiat and Warhol. Oh, and wow. This ready -made th this ready-made thing that Duchamp's and others, Duchamp's and others have created, you could take other people's stuff and sign your name to it, and it's yeah. yours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, like, of course, like he, it's, he, not he, just, you know. it's not just... Us, I mean, uh, the big issues in the in the chef world are stealing, you know, the theft of recipes. The big mm -hmm. issue in the comedy world is the theft of jokes. I mean, this mm -hmm. is a, a problem and a, uh, you know, a, a preoccupation for people in all kinds of creative fields. Because, you know, deep down, we're, we're all trying to be original, but we're all building on what came before. And sometimes the lines get a little blurry. I think we I think we know that um, to lift language is a no no. <laughs> this is like this mm -hmm. is not okay to lift a paragraph and stick it into your um, into your work. <clears throat> well, this the is a little more that, subtle. Well, well, well the, that that the French theory that uh, so it took, has taken hold in some of the English departments proposes that uh, words don't belong to you. Yeah, yeah, they belong to the critics. Oh, oh, that's an interesting oh, yeah. take. I've never absolutely. heard that before. I, yeah. I was at a conference in Finland, and Chris was wondering why the writers were getting all the attention. <laughs> so, so, so we come to that. Yeah, I mean, there's some criticism that you learn from, and you know, yeah. you come away thinking, "Wow, you know, I, I'm th this has changed the way I look at theater or the way I look at books." But not often. Usually, usually we get to do that. I think. So, you know, I would love to hear about um, the trickster tradition that you're working on. What, what is that? I mean, I'm interested in the trickster, um, you know, the, in, the, in the role of the trickster in different cultures, but what, what is the work that you're doing? Well, I think in the black tradition, one had, one had to be a trickster to survive. There's a book called Putting on Massa, where, uh, you know, uh, in the slavery situation in the plantation, slaves had to make up things or use their wit yeah. in order to uh, get out of trouble. So we had to use this as a device in order to uh, live and survive mm -hmm. the idea of the trickster. I think all oppressed groups, I mean, you heard some of the, the comedy or the, you know, yeah. some of the comic routines of people who are minorities, how they really are signifying, that's a, a term that Gates use, on the oppressors without the oppressors really being aware of it. Mm -hmm. This so, is also a feature of Jewish history. Of well, I don't, think, I don't think about the trickster. I think the trickster is something we read about um, among in Native American the common tradition mm -hmm. of the trickster. But, uh, you know, I didn't set out to write about being, uh, I didn't set up for my characters to be tricksters. It's just that they're in a press situation, some of my characters, and so they have to use that wit in order to get over it. It's kind of like a Scheherazade story. You know, you survive by your ability to distract and uh, entertain. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, there's a character. I'm I'm working on a final draft. Please God, let it be a final draft of a novel now. Which, um, and with every successive draft of the novel, this has become less and less a part of the story. But uh, there's a character who's based on uh, uh, an 18th century man named. Joseph Oppenheimer, whose job uh, in in 18th century Germany was to handle the money for uh, mm -hmm. for the local aristocrat, for the duke, mm -hmm. uh, because apparently in those days you weren't allowed to touch money unless you were Jewish. Um, mm -hmm. So, so the the rulers brought in these court Jews to handle the money. But in the case of this poor guy, who was a very successful guy until his boss dropped dead, at which point he became, uh, you know, accused of murdering him and having sex with Gentile women and all kinds of, um, all kinds of things. He ended up getting executed. But um, yeah, I think that's, 
you know, it works until it doesn't work. <laughs> well, you know, you know I, I, I wasn't aware that uh, the situation of Jewish males in, uh, under the, uh, the fascists was similar to the situation of black men in the United States until I went to a lecture uh, given by the Holocaust, uh, San Francisco Holocaust Museum. Mm -hmm. That the same kind of, you know, stereotypes were used. Yep. And like the Nazi papers, like the Sturmer, you know, a threat to Aryan women, mm -hmm. I mean, the whole, yep. the whole thing. thing. And so I wrote a novel called Reckless Eyeball. And I guess uh, I listened to that lecture too, uh, too intensely because uh, that novel drove me out of business in the United States. Oh, really? How did that oh, happen? Absolutely. Well, <laughs> well, people who, well, uh, I think some of the wacky elements in the feminist movement, they're such a, you know, I'm, I'm aware that the feminist movement begins as a grassroots integrated movement, yep. Yep. but it's sort of like co-opted by the corporations. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And so the, so the people who uh, were wrote negative reviews about it were people who like, uh, one of them, for example, uh, asserted that male ejaculation was an act of war. Huh? And, and, and another, 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 uh, saw Valerie Salinas as a uh, as a hero or a hero or whatever. Yeah, yeah. I just found that's that true. out because I'm doing research on my play. So those are the and and what wait is Valerie right? Salinas in your play? Valerie Salinas is in my play. Wow. I mean, I, I refer to her in my uh -huh. play. Wow. Because after Orhal was shot, he went back to religion. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. like it's like uh, it's like. Uh, uh, you know, there's a certain shock happened there, or a certain revelation happened there, where he started doing the Last Supper and uh, paintings with religious themes. And he he uh, was a member of some kind of really weird Greek Orthodox sect, where icons are very precious. As a matter of fact, icons are supposed to be windows on heaven. And so what he did was he used the secular icons. For example, uh, the Brillo, you know, the brand names, mm -hmm. except you get in the grocery store. Yeah. But then eventually after that shot, that the shooting, he started doing religious uh, paintings and collecting religious art. So that's where yeah. Dallas Linus comes in. Yeah, she was very interesting, but I think she was, she was, she was a very disturbed person. You know, I mean, I've, yeah, but the, I've read. Yeah but, yeah, but the feminists, on, some feminists honored her. Yeah, I, I don't, I and think so that's very here. sad. So, so these, are some people who, these, these are some of the people who criticize, uh, criticize Reckless Eyeball and try to censor it. And especially I was well, struck by- Well, Nell Painter uh, is recommending excuse, it. Excuse me. Sorry. Excuse me. Uh, <laughs> what, what got me started was a feminist who said that Emma Till, for whistling at this woman, who said that she made it up on her deathbed, yeah. her deathbed confession, was just as guilty as the men who murdered him. Mm, sure, I so agree. I work with that. That's my territory. I said I got to do something with this. You know who wrote a, a very very interesting book? Just what you were talking about before um, about the. I don't even know how to describe this. There, it's a book about how the the kind of common denominators and the way um, people uh, define populations as other. I mean, other has become a, a kind of a ubiquitous term now, but this was the first time I came across it. Anyway, her name, um, her name uh, was Susan Griffin and the book was called Pornography and Silence. Yeah, I know, yeah, I know Susan you Griffin. You know that book? Yeah. Oh, you know her? I know her. I know oh my her. God. Tell her yeah. she's amazing. Well, maybe she knows yeah, she's she lives, amazing. She, I think she still lives in Berkeley. That's incredible. Well, mm -hmm. that was an amazing, amazing book that I've recommended to a lot of people, but it, it really um, kind of opened my eyes in the way, to, you know, to the way this is a thing that has just been done again and again and again. And you just kind of fill in the blank of who you want to oppress and you, and this works. You you accuse this population group of being somehow close to the earth. And well, I, I, yeah, I, I named a, a newspaper, the, the Other, in 1965, East, the East Village Other, one of the first of the underground newspaper papers and I got it from uh, introduction to uh, Paradise Lost by Carol Jean who mentioned the term other uh -huh. to represent the devil figure in the American uh, or in the European psyche so we're back there in the city doing those things 
great. So what's your pan what was your pandemic like? I mean, did were you able to work through the pandemic? I, I submitted a short story uh, to uh, I, I submitted a short story to an anthology that's being edited by Margaret Atwood. Uh, that's being published uh, by Harcourt, I think. And we, uh, my daughter and I have a magazine mm -hmm. called Conch. She runs it, Tennessee, because she has a, she's tech savvy. And uh, we asked for submissions about the uh, the uh, pandemic. And we got stuff from all over the world, from wow. China, from Europe, and uh, of course from the United States, Canada. And uh, I think this would make a great volume if somebody wants to publish it. But I think it was something that a uh, number of writers responded to. Uh, so yeah, what was the what was the kind of common denominator in the writers who you were in communication with? Were they able to write or were they scared or was it good for them? Was it bad for them or was it just we got another a lot of day? Done, we got a lot of writing done because we're indoors. You guys get a lot of writing done in, in the East in New York, you know, because uh, Every day it's like heaven out here. I mean, <laughs> you know, you, you really feel guilty um, if you don't uh, take in the sun. I mean, you don't take a walk in the sun. But back there, there are times when, you know, I remember it's completely dark during the winter. You get a lot of work done because you're, so it's like being in New York during this pandemic yeah. because we're working inside. We get a lot of, all, both my wife and I got a lot of work done. Is she a writer as well? She is a writer and a uh, distinguished choreographer. who's worked with Robert Wilson. Mary Cunningham oh. and uh, the rest of them. And uh, she has uh, directed some of my plays. In, uh, she directed my play in China a few years ago. And so she's a director and a choreographer and a writer. And right now she's doing an article in Anna Halpern, who's a recently passed out here, the dancer, oh. and choreographer, Anna Halpern. Well, I mean, my- Her name is Carla Blank. Her name is Carla Blank, I should mention. My impression of the, you know, the theater world and the dance world is that they they really had a pretty hard time. Um, whereas we were just kind of like doing our thing, doing our stuff. It was great for, for us because we work off off Broadway. Mm -hmm. And with the Zoom, we got an international audience for wow. our stuff. As a matter of fact, it's still up. Uh, the Slave Who Loved Caviar is still up. A reading of it is still up on YouTube. And I played the son of Dracula because wow. Warhol, Warhol was very interested in Dracula. As a matter of fact, his name around the factory was a cross between Cinderella and Dracula. And he did Dracula movies. So we have like a little comic relief in there to, you know, that's overlaid by some serious uh, discussion of art of the 20th century. Did you start any new writing projects during the pandemic? Sure. I, I have a two. I have a. I have a piece, an audible called uh, this, uh, The Fool Who Thought Too Much. Mm -hmm. it takes place in the 1700s in Germany. And it's a conflict between the fool, the court fools, and the Enlightenment. And uh, I recommend that. Yeah. And I'm doing a science fiction horror story now for Audible. That's great. Called, called, called the, the Man Who Was Not Himself. That's a good title. And so, you know, I'm still working on a lot of projects. Um, I never thought I would end up doing what I did during this pandemic, which was writing a novel in four months. I mm. never, ever want that to happen again. Um, but it just, I, I had just started this book just as it was all beginning. And, um, and, and I had another novel that wasn't working out very well. And my editor and I decided that we would put down the one that wasn't working and just go with this new one. But now I'm back at that first novel trying to get it ready. And 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 I didn't need that time away from it to figure out what what it needed. It, it really took a, quite a, a long time to figure it out. But I think I'm good now. I'm going to try to turn it in next week, actually. You have so. a lot of techniques available to you. You're very fortunate. Oh, absolutely. I mean, mm -hmm. we don't have young children anymore. Our kids are out of the house. We were just. Um, we were just in this house in upstate New York and my husband and I were both writing and uh, 
you know, it was a kind of perfect storm. But I, frankly, I could have done without the rage and the fear. Mm -hmm. That would have been nice. Hey, I think there's a, um, I think there's a question for you about Al Young. Oh yeah, yeah. Yes. Well, um, let's see. Oh, it yeah. says, um, could Ishmael talk about the recently passed fiction writer, poet, essayist, memorious editor Al Young, his early con uh, collaborations and importance to American literature? Well, Al and I uh, collaborated on a number of projects, including uh, Quilt Magazine. Uh, which uh, published uh, a student named uh, Mona Simpson, who's now the publisher of the Paris Review, and Terry McMillan. We published all those uh, writers when they were students, a number of uh, well-known writers. But he was uh, the former poet laureate of California and worked with Governor, excuse me, got Governor Schwarzenegger to read a poem, one of his poems. Uh, and was a very versatile uh, artist because he's also a musician. I think he traveled through Mexico with uh, one of the Farina people, Richard Farina's uh, widow, and uh, was very known, well known on the folk, the folk scene. Traveled all over the world, went to Australia, India, and was, was quite uh, uh, a novelist as well as a poet and a musician. And uh, as a matter of fact, we performed together at our Litquake. Litquake is one of the big cultural happenings out here on the West Coast. And they uh, have a, a, a you know, uh, gatherings and poetry readings. And so uh, I played the piano and we'll be together again and brought down the house. He had a great voice. People said he sounded like Johnny Hartman or somebody. But uh, Al was an all-around writer and a, a teacher, a professor, and uh, he just did a lot of things. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, now we have one here from Carla. Um, I guess it could be for both of you. Um, can you talk about how you see the future of writing? No. It's a little general. <laughs> what do you got? <laughs> I, I think it's a good it's a good time. I, I think people are open mm -hmm. to lots of different stories, and I, I think the pandemic has been kind of good for. I mean, I've heard from so many people who said, "I, I picked up a book." You know, it's been years since I sat down with a, a novel or a book of poems, and, and that was great. I mean, let's let's just hope we can keep it going. Um, and then I guess before we end, let's see, um, what are you both reading right now? I'm always curious. Oh, I'm going to grab it actually. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we were, you were, somebody was talking, oh, you were talking about science fiction before and I usually don't read science fiction, but I'm, I'm reading this because we have one of my pop-up book groups tomorrow night with, with Helene Wecker and it's technically a sequel, uh, but I loved the first one, and it may have been the first kind of magical realism book I have loved in a long, long time. But it's, I mean, her book, her first book and this a sequel are about a golem and a genie who meet in turn of the century New York. And you can, I mean, that frankly to me does not sound like a great idea, but it is so enthralling and so beautiful. Um, she's such a good writer, and you really learn so much about turn of the century in New York. I, I have so much admiration for her ability to pull this off. And I think she lives in your neck of the woods, actually, Ishmael. I think she's out in the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. But she'll be joining me tomorrow night to discuss this book. So that's what I'm reading. Nice. What about you, Ishmael? What are you reading? I'm reading a lot of books about uh, the soul and the mind. Hmm. You know, whether the soul resides in the brain or outside the brain. Uh, because the character, the lead character in my new short story is a neurologist, a neurologist who's taking place, sort of like using the Frankenstein. I read a lot of Mary Shelley. Who, she was who great. Sort of like, who is sort of like in the situation of uh, blacks and women writers. I mean, they, they attributed her genius to her husband, Shelley, to credit for writing her books. And her family didn't understand her because she wanted to be an artist and so I'm reading all the stuff about uh, about that, the Frankenstein stuff. 
in the role. Very, very cool. Interesting. Um, all right. Well, I think that that's about all the time we have tonight. Um, I want to thank you both, uh, Ishmael and Jean, for being here with us. Thank you so much um, for every to everybody who tuned in. And of course, um, for Roger for making this all possible. Uh, don't forget to click the button right below uh, if you want to get your hands on signed copies of uh, Ishmael and Jean's books. And Susan's will have some signed copies of hers as well. Uh, I hope to see you all right back here next Monday at 7 o'clock for another episode of Write America featuring writers Gregory Pardlow and Robert Lipstein. So uh, we will see you next Monday at 7. See ya. Bye. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. Everyone. Thank you. Thanks.